let's talk about the airway. Inhalation is an active process. Your muscles are engaged, they're contracting, pulling out your thoracic cavity, making it bigger. That diaphragm pulls down, creating that negative pressure. So that negative pressure is basically just like a medical syringe. As that plunger pulls down, it's gonna be pulling that air down in. So with those muscles activated, diaphragm moves down, your intercostal muscles are contracting, open up that thoracic cavity to increase the volume you can store air. Where exhalation is more of a passive process. All those muscles relax, the diaphragm goes back up to its normal curvature, and that air releases. So again, that diaphragm, just like if you're holding that syringe upside down, as you can pull that plunger, as that diaphragm come down, it's gonna be pulling air in. And a lot of people always talk about the reason why it's harder to breathe at higher elevations. So what do you think? Is it due to oxygen? Really, your oxygen deficiency isn't going to increase until you're several thousand feet in the air, much higher than there's normal uh, inhabitants. These are people who are you know, mountain climbers. Once you get up there, you're having to wear a supplemental oxygen to be able to breathe. But no, it's harder to breathe at higher elevations because of the atmospheric pressure. So if you think about a lot of athletes, while they go to high elevations like Colorado Springs to do training, it's to go and strengthen up all those active process muscles, your diaphragm, building up your lungs and those intercostal muscles. Because at sea level, where you've got a lot of outside atmospheric pressure, when that diaphragm goes to pull down to create that negative pressure, you've basically got a whole CPAP machine outside of you forcing air in. So it's easier to take that breath in. Where at those high elevations, you've got this really thin, much lower pressure. So if you're sitting there trying to take a breath in, there's not as much outside force to shove that air in. Because respirations are all about the uh, equalization of forces going from higher concentration to the lower. So let's throw out a good even number. So if the outside atmospheric air is 750, as you go and create that negative pressure inside your body, you've created that negative pressure, so then inside might be 700. So 750 on the outside is going to go in towards that 700 quite easily. Well, if you're at a higher elevation, where your atmospheric pressure may only be 500, that's a lot less force. It's you know, nearly a third less of the force to be able to push that pressure down inside into your thoracic cavity. And for all the perfusion, all the oxygenation, really the whole process of why we breathe in and out, for all that to take place, you've got to have a few things in place. One of the biggest, most important factors is those red blood cells. You've got to have that hemoglobin for the oxygen to be able to adhere to. Then you have to have enough adequate supply of oxygen to be able to adhere to those red blood cells. So at those high elevations, you know, Mount Rainier, those big mountains and people going climbing who need that supplemental oxygen, you're getting up those high elevations and you're getting below that normal 21% atmospheric oxygen. So you're going to need that extra oxygen to support those red blood cells. And those red blood cells must be able to take, uh, take on the oxygen and offload the CO2. So uh, some conditions that can affect that is CO poisoning, as we all know. That CO has nearly 400 greater times affinity to bind to that CO. So it really likes those CO molecules, and they pretty much just beat up the O2 molecules and don't let them adhere onto the red blood cells. And you must also have good blood pressure. That's Sterling's Law. The force going in is the force going out. So if you don't have good systemic volume or good pressure, it's not going to be able to circulate those cells so you can breathe fast and there'll be a bunch of oxygen in those lungs waiting for the blood cells to come through because there's bad blood pressure bad perfusion to circulate all this stuff into the alveoli at the alveoli you've got a couple different forms of respiration externally you've got the gas exchange between the alveoli and the blood whereas internal is the gas exchange between the blood and the cells the way I always like to describe it is that alveoli is just kind of like a boat dock. So as the oxygen comes into that boat dock, it's waiting for the boat to come in. So here comes in the barge hauling a bunch of CO2. That's the waste products of all the perfusion that just happened. So CO2 comes in, 
it dumps off a CO2, O2 hops on the barge, and it makes another round to do its deliveries. And we've always been told that the avioli are these grape-like sack clusters. So in my younger days, which wasn't too long ago, always thought that those grape-like sack clusters were actually like the size of grapes. But on average, the normal body has approximately, the adult body has approximately 300 million avioli. So these are microscopic things happening here. With your respirations, there's two forms of respiration called one is aerobic respiration, the other anaerobic respiration. Big difference between the two is whether there is presence of oxygen or not. So with aerobic respiration, oxygen is present. You have a good adequate supply of oxygen. So with your oxygen, good levels of glucose, the Krebs cycle goes to work and produces high levels of ATP. So that ATP is what our body needs for uh, its main source of energy. So with that ATP, normal Krebs cycle, lots of energy production, how we should all be functioning. And without that, uh, or with that, there's going to be just a little bit of waste of CO2 and water. So, you know, we exhale the, out the CO2 and then we urinate out the water. So thinking about that, if you have a patient who's hypoxic, are they going to have much levels of energy? Or you got that hypoglycemic patient. So you take out any one of those factors in Krebs cycle, they're not going to produce that ATP. Now with anaerobic respiration, oxygen is not present or there's just not efficient amount of oxygen. A lot less energy. So the body's going out looking for sources of energy where it doesn't have that oxygen to metabolize everything. So it's out looking and searching out and just causing mayhem within the body. So it's going to produce a lot of lactic acid making that body very acidotic. We all love the Waterboy movies. Hopefully everybody watching this has seen the Waterboy. If not, a couple slides in here may not make any sense. So water really loves CO2 and they just kind of like to hang out together. So in aerobic respiration, as you see at the top up here, you're gonna have all the chemistry stuff laid out there. So you're not expecting all this, this just kind of breaks down really what's going on. So in aerobic respiration, with the presence of oxygen, of course, you've got glucose and oxygen, that's your Krebs cycle, equals CO2 and water and energy, that energy being your ATP. So up the top there just kind of explains the chemical process of that. So now let's say in poor ventilation, there's gonna be a increase of CO2. So with the increase of CO2, where it will bind to that water that's being produced, it forms carbonic acid. So when that carbonic acid forms, it's gonna drop one of the H's to form bicarbonate. So when it drops that H, when the H goes down, that increases your acidity. So that H dropping, sliding down to the acidic side of the scale. So that poor ventilation is gonna be uh, respiratory acidosis. Kind of the other thing, if you got low CO2, it's gonna do quite the opposite and be respiratory alkalosis. The medulla located in your brain stem neurologically controls all your needs for baseline ventilation. The medulla is also known as the medulla oblongata. Your primary means of regulation of breathing, the main uh, sensor that sends that signal to medulla oblongata of how to breathe are coming from chemoreceptors in the body. So from central and peripheral receptors, their main job is to measure the amounts of CO2 in the body. Whereas a lot of people think your primary means of wanting to breathe is from oxygen, it's actually depending on the levels of carbon dioxide within your body. So it's measuring out that pH level that's within your blood. Uh, so it's trying to preserve out that acid-base balance. So if you even think about your DKA patients who are acidotic, they're hyperventilating because they're trying to maintain and balance out their pH balance. And again, our secondary drive for regulation breathing is from hypoxia or the levels of oxygen. With the respirations and ventilations, there are some really important terms and concepts to, that need to be understood. 
First is tidal volume. Tidal volume is the amount of air that's taken in in one breath. So depending on which research you read, which book, whatever, your average tidal volume is about 750 for the average size adult. But the anatomic dead space, what that is, is the, all the parts of your pulmonary system from your nose to your bronchioles that aren't doing anything about respiration. So they're not doing anything with gas exchanges. So there's just air going into those hallways and they're not really doing anything except just occupying the space. And that all kind of ties into the Bohr equation. So basically what the Bohr equation means is if you don't have, um, it's the difference between your tidal volume and the anatomic dead space. So if your anatomic dead space is greater than a tidal volume, there's no air getting to your alveoli. So it's just that direct effect that you gotta have a good level of tidal volume to overcome and to be greater than an anatomic dead space. So the difference between your tidal volume and your anatomic dead space is how much volume actually gets into your alveoli for gas exchange and cellular respiration. So that tidal volume has a great effect on that. So think about if you're trying to ventilate that patient and you're not getting them appropriate amounts of ventilation, that air, you may not give, uh, provide them enough volume to get to their alveoli or, or perfuse or oxygenate all their alveoli. And with physiological dead space, that's pretty much just all uh, your anatomic dead space and the, uh, the space where it's getting uh, ventilated but poorly perfused. So there's that VQ mismatch, that ventilation perfusion mismatch. So what kind of example do you think that would be? Possibly like a pulmonary embolism to where there's ventilation going on but there's just no perfusion getting to where it needs to be. Moving on, uh, more stuff related to that tidal volume. So this is all information that's coming out of a lot of research, and this is kind of what a lot of uh, respiratory therapists and stuff, this is what they use to calculate tidal volume. So we're taking those patients on a vent. This is basically what they're, they're setting all their numbers at. Your, your tidal volume uh, multiplied by ideal body weight in kilos is you know, 6 to 8 milliliters times your ideal body weight. The six to seven range, that's for people who may suffer or have a risk of a pulmonary disease or COPD patients or somebody who could be very susceptible to developing ARDS. The higher end of that, your eight milliliters per kilo, that's non-ARDS or generally healthy patients. Um, a lot of research has shown to where anything over eight significantly increases risk of mortality and trauma. So there was a lot of clinical studies even putting people up as high as 12 milliliters per kilo and the mortality was just, I mean, significantly increased. And the way they'll calculate ideal body weight, that's not their actual body weight, because we all know that, you know, if you put on more fat, it doesn't mean you're taking in deeper breaths or your lungs are getting any bigger just because your belly is. So ideal body weight is calculated by, you take 50 plus 2.3 times uh, their height minus 60. So. Remember that my dear Aunt Sally, where you got to multiply everything first. So you do everything in the parentheses first. You take their height in inches, subtract 60 from that, multiply that by 2.3, and add that to 50. And that's going to be their ideal body weight in kilos. So just try to crunch those numbers for yourself. See what you come up with, what your ideal body weight would be. For females, it's just you add 45 and a half to 50. Now, granted, in the field, we're not going to be calculating that much, but just kind of gives you a good perspective on really what goes on the other side. Now let's do some math. Oh, great. I know. Get out your pen and your paper. So here we go. So let's calculate your tidal volume for a patient who's 220 pounds, and that is their ideal body weight. Big old, big old guy. 220 pounds, has no ARDS history or any kind of pulmonary risk. So what are you going to get for a tidal volume? So first got to convert that to kilos, 220 pounds, easy math, 100 kilos. Multiply that by which number? Eight, because they don't have any kind of pulmonary risk. So their average tidal volume is going to be 800 milliliters is what their tidal volume should be. Now to the next step of that. What's the volume of your average bag valve mask? So this is a picture of an adult bag valve mask made by Lear at all. 
really common one we always see in the field. And all the other manufacturers, they're all within 100 milliliters of one another on each age group. So at the adults, we got a person we need to ventilate who their tidal volume should be about 800. Now we got a bag valve mask. So now visualize yourself taking that bag, making a nice CE seal, and ventilating that patient and squeezing that bag. Or you've got the patient intubated, and now you've got two hands free to squeeze that bag. How are you going to squeeze that bag? So if you squeeze that bag, if in your mind you've got that bag, you're holding two hands and you're squeezing it all the way shut. Or you think about that happy fireman you've had who's been ventilating for you in a cardiac arrest. And they squeeze that bag as tight as they can, get every drop of air out of that. So how much longer do you think that bag valve mask held? 1,600 milliliters. So now you've taken that bag and you've completely squeezed as much as you can. So let's say you even only got out 1,200 milliliters out of that. What good are we doing our patients? They're being completely overventilated. So side effects of being overventilated, reduced cardiac output, possible barotrauma, increasing mortality risk, just like we talked about previously, that study showed that that increased tidal volume was increasing mortality. So, and how often are we actually ventilating patients who have health, happy, healthy lungs? Seldomly. So, we're delivering them way too much air a lot of times if you're squeezing an entire bag. They make it big to make it convenient on us to be able just to use one hand, squeeze half the bag, and be able to give the appropriate amounts of volume that we need. Speaking of airway pressure, let's move on to talk about CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. The CPAP machines, most commonly the ones we see are that CPAP OS, that yellow machine, it's got the quick dial, makes a bunch of noise, and sucks out a bunch of oxygen. That'll connect to your high pressure side of your oxygen cylinders, whether you're going off a portable tank or your main, and it'll connect in, you just use a little adjuster valve to connect and regulate your pressure. And the other delivery device, which consumes much less oxygen, uh, but just costs a little bit more, are the pressure regulated ones. So the way they work is you will set your oxygen flow rate to whatever setting the manufacturer recommends to achieve your desired um, pressure. So I think, for instance, if you want to start at 5 centimeters of water, I think you set the oxygen delivery at 8 liters per minute. So at, you know, 8 liters per minute using a lot less oxygen than you are with the other one and still work pretty well. Both kind of have their pros and their cons, depending on the manufacturers. Hi, my name is Tom Cronin with Emergent Respiratory Products, and I'm here today to talk about the Port Event CPAP system. In your kit, you have your mask, your disposable circuit, and your drive unit. And part of this kit, if you circle the tube into the top of the bag around the mask, you make sure you keep the foam on the mask from being crushed, and it gives you a nice soft seal for the patient. This mask includes a nice half inch to three quarter inch thick foam seal, which is very beneficial because most of your patients on your population base are gonna be hypoxic, a little anxious, and you wanna make sure you have as much of a comfortable seal as possible for them. The mask will be applied higher on the face so that you get a nice good seal right around because you wanna prevent leaks, because realize when you're creating CPAP for the patient, you're increasing pressure within the airway and you wanna make sure that you don't have leaks around the face. These face masks come in three different sizes. The medium, which comes with each circuit, fits about 80 to 90% of your patients. You have a smaller mask here, which works great on elderly patients and also some of your pediatrics. And in addition, you have a large mask here, which will fit folks with an overly large head. And this can also benefit those who are really, really claustrophobic. It's more of a full face mask size. These masks also accommodate the same medical grade standard port, which will fit your BVMs as well too. So if you do need to assist ventilations, you can bag right through the mask with the headgear on. I always recommend when you're letting a patient do CPAP if they can, if they can hold the mask and bring it up and take the first few breaths before you try and come around and actually strap the mask on. It gives them more of a sense of control and it also helps them benefit by uh, preventing them from getting very anxious and trying to pull the mask away. So when you come up, mask, you can come back with the head strap. This is latex-free neoprene and it's very, very soft and comfortable. It's not like the vinyl types that will pull hair and pull skin. 
It comes right around the back of the base of the skull, pulls back. You have multiple holes on the straps here so you can cinch up and down and tighten or loosen the mask as needed. So once the patient's complying on CPAP, then you can come around with the head strap. The unit comes with six foot corrugated tubing and the mask attaches to the front end of the unit. There's only one place it'll attach, so there's no complication. And on the other end of this circuit is an exhalation valve that swivels 360 degrees. What's important about this is when you're putting a patient on CPAP, everything they're breathing out comes out at velocity because it's pressurized. So you want to make sure that with each circuit, and these are included in with the circuits, you use the included HEPA filter, the N95 HEPA filter, right on the exhalation valve. In doing so, if you pick up a patient who's got wet lungs, let's say they have TB, SARS, MRSA, H1N1, or any other disease, they exhale out, cough, sneeze, anything into the system, you're going to make sure it gets filtered out and not spread to your medics. The other end of this circuit also includes a bacterial viral filter. So this protects your equipment from cross-contamination too. So if you find out after the fact that your patient did have something, you know that your equipment's been protected from the system. So once a patient's completely on the system, you have them locked out of the environment. And from a risk management standpoint, this is very important because it prevents your medics from getting sick. The circuit attaches to the unit using a tabbed bayonet adapter. Straight down, clockwise turn, keeps this locked into place. You don't want this to become disconnected on a door rail, cot guard, anything, because once you've built up pressure, the last thing you want to do is be able to drop that pressure by disconnecting this in the patient's airway. The unit itself has a built-in manometer, so you can see real-time airway pressure for the patient at any time. Included also is a dial here that lets you titrate up and down CPAP pressure for the patient. So you can start them at one or two centimeters of water pressure and slowly build up pressure in their airway. If you get to a point seven or eight centimeters of water pressure where it's too much pressure for them, you have the ability to quickly back off the pressure and drop that so that you can get to a point where they were still improving and complying on the system. In addition to that, you also have the ability to run an inline nebulizer in the system. You can take a standard T-piece nebulizer, attach it in between the mask and the circuit, which gives you a very, very effective dry line for your albuterol. This is really effective for patients with COPD and asthma when you need to get that albuterol in and their airway's already closed up. CPAP is a great, great delivery mechanism for that. In addition, you have your filter here, which is also filtering out the excess albuterol from coming off the back when they exhale. If you'd like to do entitled CO2 detection, you can either attach your sensor from your monitor on the exhalation valve here, right in between the HEPA filter and the exhalation valve, or you can also use nasal cannulas right underneath the line in the mask, right at the mouth and nose level as well, too. The system is a demand-based CPAP system, which only pulls oxygen off your cylinder on inhalation. The drive line is a 50 PSI port off of your regulator. And we recommend using the Quick Connect system. You can either have an Omita or a Chemtron. And what this does is give you the ability to quickly connect to your portable. You have your O2 pressure line here. And then when you get into the ambulance, you can disconnect, connect to the wall line in the ambulance, and then back on your portable to get into the ED. If you still have this quick connect, you can then quick connect onto the wall line in the ED so you have instant access to high pressure oxygen at all times. Because this is running off your high pressure disc port here, this still gives you the ability to run your Christmas tree barb here to run your albuterol nebulizer as well at the same time. As far as O2 consumption, since it's a demand-based system, it gives you the ability to deliver 100% FiO2 to the patient. And on a full D cylinder at 2,000 PSI, you're going to get anywhere from 20 to 35 minutes because it's gated to the respiratory rate and tidal volume of that patient. So always monitor your O2 consumption when you have this on a patient and make sure when you get down to about 4 to 500 PSI, you're looking for a new secondary oxygen source. A couple invisible features about this device. There's a built-in pop-off pressure release system in here. So if the regulator ever failed and it started pushing out 300 PSI into the unit, it's not going to go into the patient's airway. It's going to blow off on the back using a gov built-in governor. This also has built-in anti-asphyxiation as well, too. So if you do run out of oxygen, the patient's not going to asphyxiate on there. One of the other benefits of a demand-based CPAP system is that you can audibly hear the patient's respiratory rate through the system. So if the patient ever does stop breathing, the system's going to stop making noise, and you will understand and know that the patient stopped breathing, and you need to move on to secondary methods. For more information, you can go to our website at www.eresp.com. Thank you very much.
You know, over the years, there's been a real paradigm shift from the way that we used to treat CHF. Remember back in the old days, we used to use a lot of pharmacology to treat these patients. But really, we've been the catalyst for changing in the movement towards using CPAP. And CPAP has really become the standard of care. Well, today's product comes to us from Pomodyne, and it's the O2 Max CPAP Fix System. And I'm really excited to show you this. And let's look at some of these innovations. Let's look at some of the characteristics of this product. The first thing I'm gonna show you is the mask. And I'm really excited about this mask. This is a hospital grade mask. And really it's kind of a floating system. And what I mean by that is it doesn't take a lot of pressure to sit against the patient. Now you have to remember, the patient is probably claustrophobic, they're having difficulty breathing, and we don't really want to put a lot of things onto their face. So this is going to sit very, very easily, and it's really going to be comfortable for them. And remember, when we utilize this, we should put it into a place where a regular set of reading glasses would be. Another great innovation that came from Pulmonine was, if we take the head strap off, and we need to give some medication, we can now pivot the mask up that will allow us to give that oral medication without having to take the mask off and reset it for the patient's comfort. Now, we may have to give nebulized medication. Well, Pomodyne thought of that as well, and you're going to have an adapter that comes in every single packet that will allow you to give nebulized medications. One of the things that I would recommend is just go ahead and take it off and put it on, just in case you're going to need to do it, you won't have to find it later. You know, the innovations just don't stop at the mask. Let me go ahead and show you the works of this system that's really incredible. First thing that you're going to notice is, is it comes with kind of our standard applicator that will allow us to hook up to the oxygen. And what's really great about this is if we take our regulator, we don't need to hook it into the Christmas tree. We can just hook it right into the 50 PSI port, which will allow a free flow of oxygen. Think about it. Everything's going to plug and play, and now we've got medical devices that do it as well. One of the other great components is it comes with a 99.9% .9 bacterial and viral filter mask. Now think about it, whether we're in the hospitals, whether we're in the ICU, whether we're in the ambulance, is there MRSA or is there bacteria that can get into those patients' lungs? Well, at 99.9%, .9 I can tell you that we're going to stop mostly everything that's coming into this system. Another great innovation is the tube comes with the opportunity to bring it out to 72 inches. And think about it, if we could set this comfortably on the patient without having to have all that weight on the patient's face, it's really going to be a benefit to them as well. If you don't need all 72 inches, don't worry about using it. Well, let's go ahead and talk about PEEP because this device comes with it as well. One of the things that you'll notice is you're able to give 5, 7.5, or 10 centimeters of water pressure. This will allow us to keep those lungs inflated during exhalation. Maybe your protocols have a set PEEP. In my protocols, it's five centimeters of water pressure. Well, Pumadine thought about that as well. We can go ahead and pop this off, and when we order our stuff, we can say, go ahead and give me five centimeters of water pressure, and we'll have a fixed PEEP on there at all times, and we don't have to worry about adjusting. Now, one of the things that Pumadine thought of is, as we hook this system in, it allows us to get an FiO2 of 30%. But what happens if your protocols say, give them 60% or 90% FiO2, well, here's where the innovation of Pulmodyne came in, is we could actually pop this off, and now with the O2 Max Trio, it gives us the opportunity to get an increased FiO2. We could start at 30, and if we need to, we can go to 60, and then we could even go to 90. They really thought of everything when it comes to dealing with our patients with CHF. I believe the CPAP is one of the best devices we carry on the ambulance to deal with airway issues. Next, coolest, one of the best devices we have dealing with airway stuff and all real medical and trauma purposes is capnography. Um, so, for instance, how long do you think capnography has been around? So just take a second to ponder how long you've been seeing it in your research classes or this class or that or within your protocols. So Bob Page, kind of the father of capnography and EMS, wrote his first book and article on this in 1997 so that's kind of how long the thought of capnography and application of it's been in EMS so you can see here a couple quotes uh, from father bod page himself the, you know in title co2 reading without a waveform is like a heart rate without an ECG recording so yes we have the ability now to do qualitative and quantitative qualitative being that waveform that you see and the quantitative seen that numerical value. Also, and Ray Fowler, a uh, pretty infamous doctor that uh, did a lot of capnography things, says CO2 is a smoke from the flames of metabolism. Just kind of an analogy to understand how it really um, applies to the body. If you don't believe my personal thoughts on it, 
here are some snippets that come out of all the American Heart Association standards of how important continuous waveform catalography is uh, and how it's reliable in confirming and monitoring tube placement, which you know, historically that's what a lot of people think, well we use it for cardiac arrest. And now all these other purposes are coming out and how useful it is um, in other purposes besides just confirming tube placement and for adequate ven uh, sorry, manual ventilations. Um, so there's other studies showing that uh, it's just uh, pretty close or within just a couple points of being as close to ABG values on a large study that was done on a bunch of asthmatic patients. It showed that you know our qualitative and quantitative measurements we had were really, really close to what those ABGs show, which of course we all know those uh, arterial blood gases, those ABGs are the ultimate benchmark the hospitals do to evaluate their oxygen, oxygenation and CO2 production and everything like that. Uh, those color metric devices that we have on AMSs, just so everybody knows, those things are optional if you have capnography. And if you have that option, you need to take those color metric devices and just throw them in the trash. Just use capnography. Color metric devices are junk. Capnography is now the standard. Um, and also one of the really, really good things for it is using it on uh, evaluation of CPR. Grant, we can use it to assess ROS. You know, if we get that sudden increase in entitl CO2, and we use it to measure uh, evaluation of chest compressions and C total CPR quality. So AHA recommends to have a minimum of 10. 10 is your uh, qualitative or quantitative measurement for what the minimum CO2 should be during CPR. So if you're seeing it any lower than that, the person pumping on the chest isn't doing a very good job, or if you have a mechanical CPR device, it's probably shifted off the xiphoid process and needs relocated. Or if it's just staying really low, that's another justification that it's beyond any kind of efforts that can be viable. So common field uses, we're gonna use them on intubated patients that confirms tube placement. Granted, we can't go away from oscillating our patients still, but yes, we put that tube in, we get a good numerical value pop up on our monitor, that means the tube's in, we're getting some kind of CO2 return. But we still have to oscillate because if we're gonna intubate you know, a cardiac arrest patient, we got low numbers, it might be low because they've been down for a while, or it could be low because we've just right stem intubated them. So you still have that need to manually oscillate to make sure that you're in um, before the bifurcations are ventilating both lungs. And so we're going to use squares and numbers, that qualitative and quantitative measurements. Now a note to know is with pediatrics, to confirm placement with them, since you know what kind of tubes we use on peds? Yeah, we're using cuffless tubes. So there's not as good of a seal in that little itty bitty ET tube we're using. So the qualitative and quantitative measurements on that can sometimes be skewed. So you can intubate a kid, get a CO2 number, and then it can go away. Just because you don't have that good seal there and you've got a small channel trying to capture all that CO2 volume. We also use it to ensure adequate ventilation. So the body measures CO2. CO2 is the main uh, receptor chemical that's measured to determine how well we breathe. So if the body measures the CO2 to evaluate itself, try to maintain itself, shouldn't we measure CO2 since we have that ability? Uh, we're using it on uh, ventilating of the patient and how well we're going to ventilate the patient. We're using it to detect the patient's respiratory drive. So if we're assisting those ventilations and we can see their waveform, up there. But then we can kind of get in correspondence with their ventilations to assist the ventilations instead of fight against them. Uh, if we're giving those patients narcotics or their own drips, you know, keeping them sedated and they're not intubated, we can keep them on that thing to tell how well they're ventilating, making sure we're not decreasing the respiratory drive. Or if we, you know, we pick up that patient that's just overdosed on something, you know, whether it's alcohol, any kind of drugs, heroin, whatever. We can still use that to evaluate the respiratory drive. So we might pick him up and he seemed to be breathing okay. We get going down the road and you know that really rough riding aim was it went out to the lowest vendor and we can't really tell if this 400 pound person's breathing or not because they got so much jiggle to him. Well, when you have them on capnography, you can see all that on the monitor to see if they're still breathing. Um, in seizures, if that patient's doing the kick and chicken, 
we don't know if maybe they're breathing the whole time they're doing it wrong. So maybe we need to go ahead and not wait that two minutes to go and give that patient the benzos to stop the seizures. Maybe we need to get them calmed down or at least try to ventilate them while they're seizing because we don't want them to go two minutes without breathing. And CPR, we're using it to, as I said before, to ensure adequacy of the CPR, compressions and ventilations, and we're using it to evaluate uh, return of spontaneous circulation. Another thing to note is capnography and pulse oximetry are not even in the same comparison bracket. So a pulse oximetry, it just measures oxygenation only. So have you ever put a pulse ox on a patient that you have in cardiac arrest? Yeah, a lot of times if you're bagging them appropriately, got them intubated, they can have high levels of oxygen in their bloodstream. But does that mean that they're breathing well or they're necessarily perfusing well? No. So capnography is way superior to pulse oximetry. Granted, to each its own, uh, some you and that pulse ox can commonly be skewed by some measurements that we need to be using capnography for. For instance, uh, that pulse ox can be skewed by, as we all know, poor nail beds and nail polish. So the trick is to turn that pulse ox sideways, remove the nail polish, or whatever. Uh, hypoperfusion, you know, if that patient's hyperperfusing and not getting blood to their fingertips into those capillary beds, that pulse ox isn't going to pick up right. If their fingers are really cold, they've you know, they got hypothermia, they just have overall poor perfusion from being anemic or anything, those are things that can skew that pulse ox. Gases, you know, carbon monoxide can skew the pulse ox. Shows that they're at 99%, but they're still crazy short of breath because they have these affixings in their bloodstream such as carbon monoxide or CO2. So a lot of these respiratory patients pick up so much short of breath. What's our evaluative measurement? We listen to their lung sounds and we put them on a pulse ox. But that pulse ox might say 96%. And their lung sounds don't sound too bad. We're like, huh, they're getting enough oxygen. But that pulse ox could be skewed in the same manner CO skews it by retaining CO2. A lot of our respiratory patients retain high levels of CO2. You can routinely have a patient very short of breath, you know, minimal advantageous lung sounds, Pulse ox reading within normal ranges, 94 to 99. They still just don't feel real good, still not breathing real well. Put them on a pulse ox, and now they're in titles in the 60s, 70s, 80s because we're retaining so much CO2. So then your little detective hat's on, like, oh, that's why their CO, their oxygen saturation looks good because it's actually CO2 that pulse ox is picking up. So what capnography actually does, it's that partial pressure measurement of the CO2 at the end of expiration because we exhale the CO2. So the CO2 device actually creates a small vacuum. So as we're exhaling, it's trying to suck that out. Uh, in a study I talked about before in 2005, the good numbers here to look at, study in 2005, so think about the devices used to measure that in 2005. It's only gotten better. 39 asthmatics were within one millimeter mercury and only two were outside of that one to five range of what their ABG showed as compared to what EMS capnography showed. So you know, think about 2005. I don't even know what life pack or Zoll's monitors were around then, but they're nowhere near comparison to what's around right now. Our normal capnography levels, 35 to 45 millimeters mercury. Hyper, of course, anything above that. Hypo, anything below that. The devices we use to measure capnography for a capnogram, you have the nasal cannula one. Uh, it can also, some of those will double as an oxygen delivery method. Just remember, if you're using it as oxygen delivery, oxygen depletes your CO2. So if you're going to use that to measure qualitative and quantitative, maybe turn that oxygen off for just a few seconds, as that CO2 readings are instantaneous. They're not time-weighted averages by any means. They are complete instantaneous readings. So if you put them on that nasal prong, the prong is going in their nose and it got one that goes over their lips. So if they're you know, a mouth breather, nose breather, it's still picking it up and it'll evaluate all that. Then connect them to the oxygen and give them supplemental oxygen. When you do that, you'll generally see that CO2 range drop a little bit just from the wash out of the oxygen. Then you have the ET cuffs that routinely go on our advanced airways, ET tube, King Airway, Combi tube, anything. 
Um, those can also connect into your capnography devices. Uh, but in studies that I have done and that other institutions have done, the best way to measure in tidal capnography with a CPAP device is by those nasal prongs. Put the nasal prong on, then put the mask over them. Because I said before, is that O2 washes out the CO2. If you put that ET cuff one in line of the CPAP, you got that high pressure, high flow oxygen going through that, it's going to deplete your numbers. Your waveform's not too bad, but your qualitative numbers are generally off by a decent amount. This is what your routine uh, capnograph looks like. So as you see, your baseline plateau here, this is you inhaling. So as you exhale, that thing's creating that vacuum, so it's sucking, looking for CO2. So as soon as you exhale, that very first puff of CO2 as you exhale comes out. So you release a bunch of CO2 right away, then as you continue to exhale, it slowly, slowly increases. So again, as you first exhale is when that waveform first goes up. And then as you continue to exhale slowly, then as you inhale is when it goes back down and goes back down to the flat line. With your capnography, some reasons that you may see hypocapnia, uh, commonly those hyperventilating patients are blowing off a lot of CO2. So you got that person having an anxiety attack, you put them on there and they're blowing off a bunch of CO2. So that can be found in uh, some DKA patients, but generally they're still going to be within those normal ranges because they're so acidotic and they're retaining. They have a bunch of CO2 built up in them because they're so acidic. Uh, Cushing's reflex patients, you know, they're hyperventilating because that herniation or improper manual ventilation. You're doing that uh, you got the happy fireman just going to town, squeezing on that bag, and are hyperventilating that patient, reducing their CO2. And as we know, um, when you hyperventilate, that CO2 blows off. When that CO2 blows off, your vasoconstrict. So if your CO2 levels go down, your vessel diameter goes down. Uh, also, CHF, I have an asterisk there because in all the studies with CHF, there's no real good correlation in detecting um, issues with CHF in, with use of capnography just yet. Uh, hyperperfusion and shock, you know, think about a Krebs cycle. You have oxygen plus glucose equal ATP. And what's a byproduct of ATP? CO2. So we can essentially measure energy production being put off by these patients. So if they are hyperperfusing, they're not going to have much energy production because that Sterling's law kicks into that too. For hypoperfusing, not much force to go in there to circulate all the metabolism stuff that Krebs desires to produce ATP. So if they're in shock or they have hypotension, you know, one or another, they're hypoperfusing. If you hypoperfuse, your CO2 levels are going to go down. Pulmonary embolisms can be down because you know, you're not getting that CO2 back into the alveoli to exhale them. That CO2 is going to be stuck in the bloodstream. So there is an example where that ABG is going to be off from our capnography because that CO2 staying in the bloodstream, we're not able to exhale it out. So you're going to see that CO2 being low. During CPR, you know, most of the time in patients from cardiac arrest, they have very low ATP production, so not much CO2. Uh, hypothermia, again, it's a form of shock and hypoperfusion, so there's a lack of metabolism and not much ATP produced, nor very much CO2. Some reasons for hypercapnia is bradypnea. If you hold your breath, your CO2 goes up. Just the opposite, if you hyperventilate, your CO2 goes down. If you're bradypnic, your CO2 is going to go, and that, of course that goes with apnea or complete ventilatory failure. You have that inability to blow off your CO2. And again, CHF. CHF can be a reason that your CO2 levels are high. It just depends on systemic wise really what's going on. The COPD patients, they're going to retain that CO2. Um, so another good thing we can use that capnography for, you know, that, that fear of reducing the hypoxic drive of patients. We can measure all that stuff on capnography. So if we're giving them those high levels of oxygen flow, for long periods of time, we can be measuring to see if their ventilatory status is really changing. Acidosis, the patient's acidotic, their 
pH drops below 7.35, um, you're going to have those uh, low levels of CO2. So think about those septic shock patients. If they're septic, their CO2 levels are going to be low. Uh, also, you can have an oxyhemoglobin disassociation. You know, you got those um, anemic patients, everything else. You've just got reasons for, for, for poor perfusion, which are going to end up causing low CO2 when you don't have the ability for CO2 to bind and exhale out. Here's a good example of how ventilation and perfusion go hand in hand. All right, go. So you got a bit of hyperventilation. Got one that already backed out. Can't hang. And here comes the lesson. So what do you think happened? So knowing what we know about anatomy and pathophysiology, so this youngster, his respiratory rate went up. So when your respiratory rate goes up, you're hyperventilating, you're decreasing your CO2. So you're blowing off hot CO2, and that CO2 also controls your, your blood vessel size. So as he hyperventilated, respiratory went up, CO2 levels drop, and the blood vessel size decreases. So now the brain hypoperfuses and he went into sleepy timeout mode. And the opposite. If your respiratory rate goes down, your CO2 goes up, and your vessel diameter goes up. So now think about some of those anxiety patients we've had that have hyperventilated. And what do their fingers do? Yeah, they get those carpal spasms where the fingers get all contoured and crunched in. And they get freaking out because they can't feel their fingers. Well, that's because they've hyperventilated and they have vasoconstricted and now they've hyperperfused those muscles and they're spasming. Here's an example of a waveform to evaluate. See the toe here, so this is inhalation. Then you exhale. Short exhalation goes down. It's a long period before the next breath happens. And that wave gets just a little bit taller. Long wave and gets a little bit taller. And you see the respiratory rates, each pattern, it seems regular in between one another, but you can see the increase in those things, uh, in your waveforms increasing. So your CO2 levels are increasing. So by the previous slide, we know that hypoventilation causes increase in CO2. So you can see this long drawn out period here. This patient is bradypneic and they are developing hypoventilation and hypercapnia. Here's another one to evaluate. So you have this plateau here. Same pretty regular, pretty regular, pretty regular. Same distance part, same height. CO2 levels are the same. And then all of a sudden it gets really crazy tall, much higher. So these levels here might be 30, 30, 30, and all of a sudden it's at 80. And what do you think that is? Yes, that's return of spontaneous circulation. So all that CO2 that's been sitting out in the poorly perfused tissues has now gotten good circulation, gotten to the alveoli, and it's being exhaled all at once. So here, following, is another good example of resuscitation and capnography. So here's a good example of how capnography applies in resuscitation. So here we are. This person is just emitting a little bit of CO2 while CPR is in progress. So CPR is in progress, a little bit of epi, more CPR, more CPR, CPR is just continuing. So you got a little bit of CO2 you're seeing there, retaining those low levels, and you're out 12, 15 for CO2, you're still staying there, a little bit of CO2 is being produced, not too much. So you continue doing your compressions, keep evaluating qualitative measurements, Keep giving them some more epi. So you get some more epi or in this ether. A little bit of ether. Some more CPR. Some more CPR. Keeping your 
checking your numbers you're staying out 15 good high quality compressions then all of a sudden BAM there's this high level of CO2 being produced and now you check a pulse and your patient is alive another way for them to evaluate so inhaling the flat lines here nothing going on you exhale but here that normal exhalation slow plateau we normally see is goes downhill quite quick so knowing that that co2 is suctioning that is pulling in co2 then all of a sudden it's got an absence of none there what do you think is going on in this instance it means that there's a cuff leak so in the same instance i talked about the pediatric cuffs not being able to make a good seal and not having good qualitative or quantitative measurements the same thing here so if you're ventilating the patient you'll probably notice the resistance unless you're on a mechanical vent but you would see the cuff leak that is not getting a good seal to create that vacuum to pull the CO, appropriate levels of CO2 in continue with the trend another way for them to evaluate so flatlined nothing going on then all of a sudden exhale CO2 production but it's coming out not fast like it should it normally comes up pretty fast then a plateau but this is releasing really slow there's not that sudden surge of CO2 being produced or being able to read it's slow release of CO2 and then back down so what do you think causes that that's bronchoconstriction that air is being trapped in so as that CO2 is getting alveolar a lot to be exhaled out, this bronchoconstriction is limiting the amount of uh, exhalation volume that can occur so that CO2 is being trapped. Similar to squeezing the stem of a balloon and having that squeaking sound, the air being trapped coming out very slowly is bronchoconstriction. Here are some more examples of different waveforms. So starting at the top here, that sudden loss of waveform could mean you've disconnected your ET tube, it's become dislodged, or your capno line has become plugged with something. Uh, you're decreasing CO2, developing these weird waveforms. Again, not a good seal, so you've probably got a cuff leak or you've blown the bulb in whatever tube you're using. Your CPR assessment, making sure you got good uh, qualitative and quantitative measurements here. And again, AJ recommends to stay above 10 millimeters of mercury for adequate CPR. A sudden increase in CO2, again, that's resuscitation. That shark fin appearance of bronchoconstriction from asthma or COPD. Those long, drawn out, increasing in height waveforms as hypoventilation. Then the opposite, shorter, closer together, decreasing in size, hyperventilation. If you just see weird stuff all around, apnea, if you've got weird waveforms, then good plateaus, weird waveforms, uh, probably that patient's being sedated, possibly trying to breathe over the tube, or um, just not having good respiratory drive. Now let's talk about some examples and some cases. So in case number one, you're responding to a patient who's had major bleeding from a traumatic injury and now the bleeding is controlled. You've assessed them, the blood pressure is 78 over 40, restore rate is 28, 91% on room air, heart rate's 126 sinus tack, and tidal CO2 of 18. They're pale, cool, diaphoretic with an altered mental status, a GCS of 445. So what's your treatment and your differential diagnosis for this patient? Hopefully, that treatment differential diagnosis is they are hypoperfusing, they need a large bore IV and fluid replacement. So, you started that large bore IV, you've administered fluids, you got your handful, you're in transport to a trauma center, and you just haven't got time to get that blood pressure just yet. But all your instantaneous readings are telling you that you've got a respiratory rate of 22, because your capnography will tell you the respiratory rate. You have a pulse ox reading at 96%. Their heart rate has come down to 106, and their end tidal has increased to 30. Do you think your treatment's working? The answer is yes, it is. For one, you're reducing that comp compensatory mechanism on the heart rate, so the heart rate's coming back down, and the CO2 is increasing. So that means 
you're increasing that perfusion that's helping increase that ATP production. So that oxygen and glucose is working producing ATP. Now your CO2 levels are increasing as well. Case number two, SWAT on two patient who's in post uh, seizure transport. Their BEP is 116 over 80, rest to rates 15. They're 98% on room air, blood glucose 142, heart rate of 86, normal sinus rhythm, and tidal CO2 of 38. They are pink, warm, and dry. What's your treatment differential diagnosis for this patient? Now let's say that patient begins to demonstrate tonic-clonic seizure-like activity. They're doing the kicking chicken. And since you already had your capnography hooked up, here's the waveform that you're seeing. So they were at 40, staying at 40, and now you're seeing this long, prolonged, little squiggly lines down here. So is your patient breathing? No. Do you think it's possibly time to start intervening and giving benzos or something, or you want to let our patient go apneic for two minutes? Next case. You got a patient who has a traumatic brain injury from a fall. They've got an altered GCS at 224, hypertensive at 210 over 128, respiratory varies 12 to 30. They're having a toxic Shane Stokes respirations, 95% room air, blood glucose is 102, heart rate sinus Brady of 48, their end title is 45. What's your treatment and differential diagnosis on this patient? So treatment, differential diagnosis, yeah, the patient is herniating. They are hypertensive, bradycardic, with ataxic respirations. That is Cushing's reflex. So that Cushing's reflex, signs of herniation, how do we want to treat that patient? Yes, we control the airway. If there are signs of impending central nervous herniation, increased BP, bradycardia, decreased GCS, dilation of pupils, paralysis, the cerebral decortical posturing, ventilate the patient 12 to 20 breaths per minute, maintain an end tidal CO2 at 30 millimeters mercury. This is pulled straight out of the West Virginia protocols, which is verbatim of what PHTLS says. So we need to monitor capnography and trauma patients as well. Next case, you have an adult who's experiencing difficulty in breathing. They've got a history of COPD and CHF. Have a GCS of 456, blood pressure is 142 over 96, respiratory rate slightly labored at 25, 90% on room air, blood glucose of 102, heart rate is 66, end tidal CO2 of 45. Their lungs are shallow and diminished, which are treatment differential diagnosis for this patient. So with that patient, what's your differential diagnosis? You see this waveform here. You're having a really hard time oscillating because it's diminished. You're in the back of a bumpy ambulance, but you see the shark fin appearance. So do you think this is CHF or COPD? Yeah, you see the shark fin appearance. There's bronchoconstriction going on. Still, on a side note, both could be occurring simultaneously, but generally this is going to be your bronchoconstriction, and you treat it accordingly. In closing, just remember, the body measures CO2, so we should too.